stop without being ground. My fire I must kindle with chips gathered without being ground. I wash in the cool and the dry on a sack. I carry my wardrobe right on my back. For one of another, and I cook in a pot and I sleep on the ground for one of a cup. cowboy. No silver spurs, no six guns on his hip. It's 30 below and the wind cuts to the bone and the cattle stand half blinded by the snow waiting for food. Start pitching that hay cowboy or there won't be any herd come spring. You think a cowboy's life is romantic? Just try it in winter sometime. fancy ideas about cowboys myself when I first came out here last spring to do a picture story about them for a magazine. I was being met by a fellow named Gus Roberson and I remember how I stood on the station platform at Gunnison, that's in Colorado, half expecting to see him gallop up like the Lone Ranger, shoot off a gun and draw, howdy stranger. When he arrived in a pickup truck I found myself thinking he doesn't look like any cowboy I ever saw. More like a businessman, or maybe a gentleman farmer. Gus saw right through me. As we drove off, he said, I don't know what kind of a story you aimed at cowboys. But if it's the old Wild West stuff, I'm afraid you're not going to find it around here. He was right. We drove through Gunnison and it turned out to be strictly modern. And so was the highway that led to the ranch. Gus owns one of the finest ranches in the area. As we drove up, I saw cottonwood trees and buildings that looked pretty much like any well-to-do farm. Old buildings and new. The ranch was homesteaded by Gus's grandfather, and each generation has built it up a little more. Gus introduced me to a couple of his right-hand men and I began to change my idea of how a cowboy really looks. We walked around looking the place over and Gus explained that this was called the home ranch and was used chiefly for winter feeding and breeding. It's smaller than I thought it would be, only a few hundred acres of meadowland. But Gus told me that's all you need out here, because the cattle are moved to government-owned ranges as the seasons change, depending on where the pasture is best at that time of year. While we were talking, up rode a fellow who looked more like my idea of a real cowboy. First person I'd seen on a horse since I came west. But his name turned out to be Tony Buffano which of course no real cowboy is named. And when I saw him roll a cigarette with both hands instead of one, I was really sad.
Gus wanted me to go for a ride around the ranch, and there was no way I could get out of it. I put on my brand new blues and went out like a steer going to slaughter. Now the horse is a noble animal, but he's built too high off the ground. You fall off a horse, it's like falling out of a second story window. This horse they had picked for me was just a little short of three stories. Take it easy, Gus said. She's a little nervous. She's got nothing on me, I told him. Made it to the saddle, and when I looked down at the ground, I wished I was back in Detroit. walked for a while, and Gus told me how Gunnison lies just west of the Great Divide, in the heart of the Rocky Mountains. Then my horse began to trot, and I was too busy hanging on to listen. But even on a horse, I could see that this was great country. my first good look around the range. Sort of took my breath away. Immense and quiet, with the wind whispering in the grass and the mountain peaks towering against the sky. I got my first look at cowboys in action when I went out to take pictures of them branding calves. And now it began to look more like the Old West. Cattle still have to be branded as a precaution against getting lost, strayed, or stolen. The brand is the owner's identification mark. Branding burns away the hair and only sears the skin enough to leave a scar. The Roberson brand is the quarter circle L. A brand can be changed, so as an added precaution, the calf is earmarked. At the same time, it is dehorned by applying a paste which eats the horn away. Each calf is inspected for pink eye and inoculated against blackleg, a disease which used to wipe out whole herds before the serum was discovered. had a calf of his own in the corral that morning. His son, learning the business. The fourth generation. It was rough, hard work, but Gus was right in there sweating it up with the other cowboys. As soon as the last calf had been finished, they were all let out to rejoin their mamas. cattle is that every cow can tell her own calf by the scent. She never makes a mistake and keeps looking for her young one until she finds it. By this time, the boys had worked up a healthy appetite. It didn't take long for them to wash up and fall in for chow. 
At Gus's ranch, a cowboy eats well. Mrs. Roberson has charge of the food, and a man takes away all he can carry without a wheelbarrow. For a while, the only sound was the chomping of jaws. But a cowboy has too much energy to sit still for long. If there's nothing else to do, he'll start a rough house. A cowboy's everyday chores keep him plenty busy. He's a jack of all trades. Beside being nursemaid to the pedigreed stock, he has to know how to be a blacksmith and shoe his own horse. When something needs to be built or repaired, he turns carpenter. He's an expert at grooming a prize bull for a show. He can milk a cow as well as any farmhand. And in springtime, he's out there in rubber boots with a shovel, digging irrigation ditches. But when you see him riding the range or relaxing in the bunkhouse, it takes you back to the old west. He was huddled in a heap, had to head up the draw, oh, cuddle in a bunch to keep warm. Lampy tied his feet, told him over his horse, then he started for the shack. But the wind commenced to blow, and the snow fell high and pulled Limpy straight from his track. He reached camp three in the morning and he put the little Maverick to bed. He flopped in his bunk, unable to move. For next morning, poor Limpy were dead. Now there's a room for every cowboy who has that kind of love. And he'll soon be riding for paint over again when he rides on that range up above. All through May and June, the cattle have been moving up into the foothills to graze. Along about July, the grass there turns brown too. And now starts the long drive up into the mountains where the green pastures lie. Every year, the trail they take is about the same. Cattle will follow like sheep. So the cowboys pick a bull and a couple of cows who know the way and use them as leaders. With this advance group goes the trail boss and the main herd follows. The dogs help keep the herd moving. I thought they must be specially trained, but the boys said no, they just liked to do it, and one taught the other. I was right up there with the rest of the boys. The herd was only going three miles an hour. The trail leads across rocky slopes and gullies and through woods, and the cowboys have their hands full keeping the herd together.
now, my horse was going his own gait, and mighty rough it was, too. I wondered how many cattle we had left behind in the woods. I was amazed to find out that we hadn't lost a single head on the drive so far, and that such a thing rarely happened. The trail wasn't always straight up, but slowly we were gaining altitude. It takes two to three days to reach the top, and the cowboys never push the herd because they don't want the cattle to lose weight. Progress may be slow, but there's never a dull minute. Cattle are contrary beasts. One may suddenly break and run for the nearest cliff and have to be driven back before he falls and kills himself. Finally, the long drive came to an end. The cattle stood grazing quietly. The men unsaddled their horses. Even the dogs rested. And where was I? A mile and a half behind. My horse and I had reached a mutual understanding. I was to walk, he was to carry the saddle, and no charges would be brought by either party. I took quite a kidding from the boys when I arrived, but I was so glad to sit down I didn't care. We were 12,000 feet up and it got cold that night. We needed the campfire and plenty of hot coffee to keep warm. As we sat there, I got the strange feeling that time had moved backwards and that all this was happening a hundred years ago. All summer long, the cattle from the many ranches in the valley stay cool and high in the mountains, grazing and putting on weight. This is part of the national forest. The land is public domain and the ranchers pay an annual fee for the use of these ranges. Once the drive is over, only a couple of cowboys are left to ride herd. After the rough hard work they've done all spring, riding the summer range seems like paradise. The long days roll past slowly, full of sun and space and silence. And after a while, this loneliness and grandeur throws a spell over the cowboy. He too becomes touched with silence and solitude, which gives him an extra air of dignity and a certain timeless quality as well. The work is easy. He puts out salt lick for the cattle, sees that none of them stray too far from the main herd, and keeps a wary eye out for cattle thieves. His adventures are simple, like seeing a deer in the forest. If he wants fish for dinner, he cuts a branch for a rod, catches a grasshopper for bait, and pulls a couple of trout out of some clear, cold mountain stream. keep his hand in for the deer season. Back in Gunnison, the rodeo is livening things up.
this is the cowboy's big day. Now he gets a chance to show his stuff. The everyday work of the boys from the ranch is transformed into spectacular events that show their skill and daring. First comes calf roping. The cowboy has to rope and throw the calf, then bind three legs together in a knot that holds. The judges time him to a split second. The horses are trained to keep the rope tight so the calf can't get back on his feet. If they don't, this is what happens. plenty mean. He'll gore you if he can. Bulldogging. A hazer rides to the right of the bull and keeps him from swerving. He times his fall, grabs both horns and locks the steer's neck under his right armpit. He has to turn the bull clear over onto his other side. Stopwatches check how long it takes. These bulls may be small, but they weigh plenty, and they can be very obstinate. Getting them off their feet depends on sheer strength. Time often runs out just trying to bring them to a halt. Stay on for 10 seconds. The bell signals the time. Under the rules, he has to spur the horse out of the chute. These horses don't need any encouragement to buck. They just do it naturally. Contests are judged on how well they sit the horse, and also how tough the horse is. This year, the horses were plenty tough. One of them, named Babyface, had never been ridden for more than six seconds. there, you'll never get me on a horse again. A cowboy is a part-time farmer, too. He has to grow hay for the cattle to eat during the winter. As the summer comes to an end, he's out there working the hay stackers. Some of the old-fashioned horsepower stackers still lift their rakes slowly against the sky. But more
more and more machines are coming onto the landscape and making the cowboy's life easier. The tractor and its multiple uses are revolutionizing this part of the cattle industry. Even so, hay is a major project on the ranch. In the spring, the meadows are soaked with water and the feed crop shoots up fast and high. Then the water is cut off and the summer heat dries the crop so it can be mowed and stacked. Modern stackers, powered by trucks instead of horses, have cut down a lot of time. But haying is still a long, hot chore, as any cowboy with hay down the back of his neck will tell you. You can tell it's fall when there are haystacks in every field. The boys are ridden fence until every wire is strung taut. High up in the mountains where the cattle are, the leaves are turning and the wind has a touch of ice in it. And now the herds are rounded up and driven down into the valley again. The drumming of hoofs sets long echoes rolling across the mountain passes. Down from the pastures they come, each herd with a different brand on its flanks. The I Bar from Powder Horn, the Lazy JC from South Beaver Creek, the Crossbar from Upper Tomichi, the JEO from Old Agency, the T Quarter Circle from Red Mountain, the Bar V7 from Swampy Pass, and the Quarter Circle L out of Gothic. Down, down they come. This time, their destination is different. Solid with meat, healthy and strong, they are going to be shipped off to the stockyards. This is the most exciting day of the year for the cowboy. Since the spring before last, he's sweated blood to raise these cattle. He has tended them through snow and mud and dust till his bones ache. And now, after all his work and misery, he's finally going to put them in the cars and see the last of them. He can hardly wait. <laughs> shut and now the cowboy can relax and so can the owner. This is the payoff. There they go. But nobody will be able to rest for long. Back at the home ranch, the base herd will have to be nursed through the hardest season of all. Well, 
I came out here to get a story, but it turned out quite a bit different from what I expected. I found that the cowboy isn't the romantic, swashbuckling figure that legend has made him, and I have a sneaking suspicion he never was. He was probably pretty much the same in the old Western days as he is now, but that still makes him one of the most rugged characters in the American scene. I said to Gus, I sure wouldn't trade jobs with you, mister. Yeah, he said, there must be some easier way to earn a living. Reckon I'll quit the cattle business and get me a nice soft job back in town. But that's just talk. Next spring, Gus will ride out on the range and look things over, and he'll feel good again. Leave the range, not Gus. Never in this world. The range is a cowboy's home. All day on the prairie in the saddle.